So let's get started. So um, just FYI, so we have an online session for the last block, unfortunately due to, to some family uh, being in town and, and other child uh, care issues. That video is not posted just yet. I will try to get it out as soon as I can. I'm sure all of you are eager just to go straight out and watch the video. <laughs> One time. It's just this once, you would actually go out there and watch it. So just an FYI, so this lecture right here, lecture nine, is going to be end of the material for the test, okay? The next lecture, lecture 11, which I'm going to cover, is going to be uh, for the epidemiology section. It's going to start up after the test. So this is going to be, it'll be for later material. Uh, so that's why I figured it wasn't quite as critical for you to get that video out and, and watch that immediately. So we have this. The review is going to be um, uh, lecture 10. So I'll post that up before we have our lecture on Wednesday. And then I believe it's Wednesday. <clears throat> Tuesday or Wednesday, and then we'll have a journal club to go along with that, okay? We can't really do a Kahoot review for the test because the character limits are such that I can't really do like good kind of representative questions uh, for the exam, uh, so because they're a little wordy as it turns out. Uh, so I'm going to just have a PowerPoint that we'll do a, a review with and kind of go through it with that. So I want you to make sure you at least have that review. Um, how does everyone feel about the class so far? Do you feel like it's making sense? Have any of you? Okay, that's good. This is a good <laughs> feedback, right? So we'll talk about some of these things here. What are some issues maybe you think you're having in terms of maybe something you're not clarified on? Anything at all? I'm going to be honest. I still don't understand what confidence, confidence interval is. Perfect. That's, that's perfectly acceptable. All right, we can talk about that. So um, again, when we come up with confidence intervals, what is that really telling us? Right, so it's basically making an inference about, so we have a sample, right, so we, we have a group of people that we may do a study with, and say we give them a medication to lower their blood pressure, right, and so say it lowers that, that patient's, that sample, uh, an average of say 10 points, 10 millimeters of mercury on their systolic blood pressure, right, and we can develop from that, based on the variability sort of inherent to that sample, say we did 100 patients, we can then try to make extrapolations back to the whole population, right? Because again, we don't know what the whole population would actually show, but we can at least try to come up with a pretty good guess. So let's say if on average, it dropped that patient's blood pressure 10 points, right? Systolic. What we can then do is come up with a confidence interval. And it gives us basically a range. It says, well, if we were to apply this back, and if we were to actually run the study in the entire population, what do we actually think the actual the drop in blood pressure would be? Would it be 10 exactly? Well, probably not. We couldn't be 100% sure that it would be 10 because we know there's more variability to it than just in what's in that 100 patients we actually looked at. And so we come up with a range there. We come up with a range that gives us an idea of if we applied this back to the population, what do we think the actual drop in blood pressure would be? Okay. So we give ourselves a little bit of wiggle room because we don't want to say we're 100% sure because anytime you say I'm 100% sure, guess what? You're probably wrong, right? And so it's very easy to be wrong if you say you're 100% sure. But if I say I'm 95% sure, at least you give yourself a little bit of wiggle room to be wrong, right? And so that's why you end up getting a range there that says, okay, well, if I apply this back, I think somewhere if I were to give this medication to the entire population, this is what I think their drop in blood pressure would be on average. Okay? So I can be 95% sure, which I'll get a certain confidence interval. What if I only wanted to be like 85% sure? What would I do to my confidence interval? It would actually make it smaller, right? Because I need even less wiggle room because I have 15% chance that I'm wrong. No, no, no big deal, right? If you know if I'm wrong, no problem. So I can narrow up that confidence interval, right? What if I want to be 99% sure? I have to make it wider because I have to give myself more room to be, you know, more wiggle room in that case there. So, you know, it's one of those things where you have to understand how things like sample size and how, how sure you want to be will have an effect on those confidence intervals. Now, what if I were to say increase the number of patients I was looking at? Say instead of 100 uh, people in the sample, I said I did 1,000. What would that do to my confidence intervals? Would it narrow or more wide? It would narrow. Why is that? So I'm accounting for more of that variability in the population. I'm getting closer to what that actual population looks like, right? If I were to say get up to say 10,000 patients, be even more narrow. If I get a million patients, be even more narrow. Because as soon as you get closer and closer to that actual population you're curious about, you get closer and closer to what you actually to being very sure of what that actual mean would be if I applied that drug to the entire population. Does that make sense? So again, you're just giving yourself that little bit of wiggle room to say, like, I'm pretty sure, I'm not 100% sure, that the actual range, if I apply this to the greater population, would be this, okay? So it could be mortality rates, it could be uh, drop in blood pressure, it could be, I mean, it could be anything, right? Infant mortality, a lot of different things you can apply it to. Um, and why do we look at infant mortality? Why do we talk about that so much? It's kind of a bummer topic. 
because oftentimes it will apply it back to how healthy of a nation do you have, right? If you have a really good healthcare system, your chances are of having healthy neonates is going to be a lot better than if you have, say, a pretty poor sort of health system. So that's why they end up looking at a lot of that in epidemiology, say. So would I clear that up a little bit, maybe? We'll get some examples of this too as we go through. And the journal clubs will help out with this additionally. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so when you get into the exam, so just kind of give you a primer for the, the review we'll have uh, next week. Um, so the, there's no calculations on the exam, right? So you don't need to know how to calculate standard errors in the mean. You don't need to know how to calculate p-values, et cetera, um, because we don't do that clinically, right? We don't need to do that. We have statisticians that, that do that for us. Um, what we need to be able to do is to interpret the literature. So if you get a p-value back or if I ask you what the standard error of a mean is, what does that mean, right? What does that actually, uh, how do you define that sort of thing? How does that, how does that apply? Um, so if I give you a confidence interval and a p-value, like can you actually interpret that? It's something statistically significant. Is it clinically significant? Those are things we want to be able to look at, right? And so I'll tell you the test, there is some definitional stuff, but a lot of it is interpretational, right? So you have to, you'll have like a big block of text saying, here's the study, here's how they performed it. What kind of conclusions can you make about this study based on the results, okay? So the journal club will help out with that. The reviews will help with that. Uh, with that. This section will help out too. Can you explain a confidence interval with respect to a like hypothesized mean, like where the range, like where the range stacks up in comparison to it, like if it covers it or not? So looking at like a, a risk, uh, like a relative risk oh, or an yeah. odds ratio. Yeah. So that's where you. So now once we start comparing groups, is when we're going to start to get things like relative risk and odds ratios. And there's a section in this a little bit later, but just briefly. So when we're talking about just a pure confidence interval, say taking one sample and performing an experiment and then applying that to the population, that's one thing. But oftentimes in studies, we're going to do more experimental studies where we're comparing groups to one another, right? So maybe we look at the outcome and smokers versus non-smokers. We have some people on medication or placebo and comparing those two together, okay? And so you can get things like relative risk. We'll talk about odds ratios and trying to determine is something significant or not, right? And so we can look at that just by looking at the confidence intervals, okay? So as an example, let's say I did a study where I went ahead and Again, you have to watch my horrible drawing, but let's look at this. Um, so let's say, for instance, I did a study where I'll say, and again, I'll go back to medications because I'm the medications guy, right? So um, let's say we did uh, uh, two groups. We had one receiving placebo and one receiving an antihypertensive, okay? And so let's say, for instance, if we wanted to look at the relative reduction, actually just look at the absolute reduction of blood pressure between those two groups there, okay? So let's say we had group A, right? And then we have group B. And so I can see that maybe in group A who got the placebo, so I'll put a little P here just for placebo, maybe they only had like say a three point reduction in systolic blood pressure, okay? And then group B who had the active drug, so I'll put a D for drug, um, group B ended up having say a 10 millimeter drop of mercury, okay? Now looking between those two, you can see what the absolute reduction is on average would be like seven points, right? So the placebo group had only a three point reduction, uh, the treatment group had a 10 point reduction. You can just subtract one from the other, right? Well, when you do that, you're going to end up getting a confidence interval when you actually look at that. When you're comparing the means together, you would end up getting, say, a mean reduction of 7 millimeters of mercury, and then you end up having a confidence interval here, okay? And it, say, may range from, say, let's look at, um, let's say, a range of 1.2 to, let's say, 10, okay? So the question is, is that significant or not? Is that clinically or statistically significant? So when looking at this, we're looking at the mean reduction in blood pressure. If there was no difference between the groups, what would be the mean reduction of blood pressure? Zero, because I'm subtracting one from another. So if it was three minus three, it would be zero. So in this case here, when you're looking at the confidence interval, you would say, well, does this include zero? If it does include zero, and the possibility that if I were to actually extrapolate this out to the population, that it would include that zero and there's no difference. And I cannot conclude that this is statistically significant, okay? So in this case here, because it's 1.2 to 10, would you be able to conclude that it is statistically significant? Yes. Yes, you could, right? That is when you're doing absolute reductions, right? So you're doing one thing minus another thing, a differences in between groups, okay? Now, if I wanted to look at something else where I was looking at a relative rate, so let's look at, say, the incidence of death between... Uh, say, uh, MI between group A to group B, right? So I would see maybe the death rate here in, in group A was say, let's say for instance, 30%. I think this would be pretty high mortality rate. But then in say group B that actually got active drug, let's say it was only 10%. 
okay? So by comparing those two together, you'll be able to say, well, what is the actual relative risk of death in the treatment group versus the placebo group? So how would I figure that out? Well, for the relative risk, and so I would take one mean and divide it by the other mean, okay? So I would take that 10% and divide it by 30%. So what would be my relative risk? 0.333 for being right. So you know, we'd say that the relative risk would end up being 0.3, okay? So you get that, that's the, that's the relative risk of death. You're, if you got active treatment, your risk of death was roughly a third as compared to the placebo group, okay? Well, let's look at the confidence interval here. So if these were the same, if they were both 30% and I were to get the relative risk, what would it end up being? One, okay? 30% divided by 30% is one. So in this case here, if the confidence interval included one, then I would be able to say that it's not statistically significant. So say for instance, if I would say went from zero point, I probably should have dropped my parentheses out a little bit further, but 0 0.12, and then let's just say I'm in the parentheses still, but it went up to say 1.1. That's a pretty wide confidence interval, right? But is this statistically significant? No, because it includes one, because it over, uh, crosses over one. In that case there, you cannot say it's statistically significant. Now, if it went from, say, 0.12 to, say, 0.9, would that be statistically significant? Yes. Yes, because it does not include one. So when you're dividing one thing by another, you're getting a relative risk, or if I'm doing an odds ratio, a ratio of one thing to, the odds of one thing to the odds of another thing, those are always going to be one is your level of significance. If it crosses one, then you know it's not going to be significant. If it's something, one thing minus another thing, and it crosses zero, then you know it's not significant, okay? Again, once you see this a couple of times, you read a couple of articles, and this is what the journal clubs are going to help to solidify in your mind, this will make more sense. You'll be able to look at these confidence intervals and be able to know whether something's significant or not. Now, what's the easier thing you could do? The p-value, right? I could just look at the p-value, and in this case here, say in this instance where I'm just looking at absolute reduction of blood pressure, the p-value is probably going to be what? Right, it's going to be less than 0 0.5 because we already concluded that based off the confidence interval, this is statistically significant. So I'd be able to say that, yeah, well, the P is probably going to be less than 0 0.05. I don't know what it is exactly, but we would be able to surmise that, okay? How about for the second one here, I was looking at the relative risk of death. Somewhere about 0.05. This one ended up being greater than 0.05, okay? Because I said it's not statistically significant, I know it's going to be above 0.05. And at that point, what does that mean if something is above 0.05? Not statistically significant. What does that mean, though? Yeah. It's probably just due, it could just be due to chance alone. The risk of it being just due to chance alone is so high, that it's like, well, I can't even take a conclusion from this, right? So in this case, would I reject the null hypothesis? No. Because what's the null hypothesis? There's no difference between the groups, right? There's no difference between the two. I cannot reject the null hypothesis. If I incorrectly reject the null hypothesis, what is that called? Type one. The type error. one error, right? If I incorrectly conclude that there is a difference when there's not one, that's a type one error, okay? What if there is a real difference, but I can't find it? The type two error, right? The false negative, where I cannot, I should be rejecting the null hypothesis, but I can't do it because I don't have the stats to show me that. What is the oftentimes a reason why I have a type two error? Your confidence interval is too wide. Could be that, yeah. So again, you're showing that the, the results are not significant, but why is it, what's the reason in terms of study design? Sample sizes frequently at, right? So very frequently, most of the studies you look at tend to be underpowered, right? Power is that ability to detect a difference should one exist. So if I have too small a sample size, because I can only, say, recruit PA students that have available to me, because they're here anyway, and so they're a convenient sample, then I may be underpowered to actually find a difference in whatever I'm looking at, okay? I would never experiment on you guys. To your knowledge, I would never do that. <laughs> So, those that aren't laughing, you're the experimentees. No, um, okay, does that make sense so far? Everyone kind of following along the logical steps here? What other questions do you have? If some of you are completely lost, it's okay. You can go back, watch those videos again, review this again, and be like, oh yeah, it totally makes sense. I wish I'd watched that before I came into class. That's okay. Right. 
Let's put it all together though. All right, what are we going to be looking at here? So I want to talk about using appropriate statistical tests. This is a very frequent problem with certain articles where we find they're not really using the appropriate test for what they're looking for, which can cause issues of causing type 1 errors, type 2 errors potentially. We'll talk about some study designs. We'll also look at when we're looking at the literature, which is something we'll do next week. What are we looking for? What are the different bones of an article um, that come to make a whole piece of literature that we want to, to review? Okay. So how do we choose a statistical test? What do you think is one of the first things we look at when we're choosing whether we're, uh, what kind of test we're going to use? Hmm? <coughs> so remember we talked about the two types of tests we could run. There's parametric and non-parametric. When do I use each one of those? Okay, so we don't use that test to determine if it's Gaussian, but if it is Gaussian, if we have a normally distributed set of data, do we use parametric or non-parametric tests? Parametric tests. Okay. So the first thing you have to know is your data set, is it normally distributed or not? Okay. It's going to be the first thing you're going to determine because I'll tell you, are you going to use parametric or non-parametric tests? So here, we're looking at continuous data. We'll look at some other ways we can look at our data. And when I say continuous, what does that mean? Yeah, it's, a, it's a type of variable it is, right? We talked about other types of variables. We talked about ordinal. We talked about nominal variables. Continuous ones are going to be on a continuous scale where the difference between 1 to 2 is the same as the difference between 9 to 10, right? As opposed to like an ordinal scale where that magnitude of difference may differ between point to point, correct? So looking here, when we want to determine if our data set is Gaussian or not, what kind of test do we run on it? The test for normality, right? So we can tell is it normally distributed or not. It tells us is the data set that we're looking at, is it likely to be coming from a randomly sampled subset of that population? And if it gives us a high p-value, then chances are that yes, it is with, from that normal, uh, from that, that randomly sampled set from the population, we're good to go. What happens if we have a low p-value from, from a normality test? Always think back to your null hypothesis whenever you're running a test here. In this case here, if I have a high p-value telling me there's no difference between my samples of the population, presumably if I have a low p-value, it means that my sample set really differs a lot from that normally distributed set of data from that, that population. In that case, once I reject that, I can't use these parametric tests anymore. It's a switch over. Okay? So just know if you fail that normality test, again, I always joke that I always fail every normality test I ever take. <laughs> However, if your sample fails that, then you have to switch over to using non-parametric tests because you cannot assume that you're using a Gaussian population or a sample set. You cannot assume that your data is normally distributed. Okay, So normality tests help with that. Also, remember, when you're using a normally distributed set of data, are you normally looking at means or medians? Yes. Use the means, right? But what's the problem with means? It's a, a pitfall. Outliers, right? And re remember, when you're using a non normally distributed set of data, the outliers are what's really screwing you up because you have these people that are under or overperforming for whatever value and it's skewing your data. So means tend to be very sensitive to the effects of outliers. However, our eyes are very hard to, or very easy to trick in terms of is a value an outlier or not. We can't really tell that well. And so in these cases here, we use outlier tests to look to see is a value, would that normally come from a, uh, the, the population or is it so different that it's probably unlikely to? So that's where the outlier tests really come into play here, okay? So again, this is testing the assumption, do we have a normally distributed set of data or do we not, okay? Let's say we pass all those tests. Let's say, okay, we're good. We have a normally distributed set of data. Now, what kind of test can we run off of that? These are our parametric tests. Remember, you can describe your sample. So this is not actually running any kind of hypotheses. You're just describing what you actually end up finding there. So you can do a frequency distribution. How do you get a frequency distribution? You just count how many times you get the same value over and over, right? So again, that's where you end up getting that bell-shaped curve. Yes, so you end up getting a frequency distribution like that. Um, so for instance, like when we look at your exams, uh, your performance on the exams, we typically look to see, do we get a nice bell-shaped curve around a certain value, usually around 88, 90 or so, right? If we see something's really screwed up, we see that it's really skewed to the right or really skewed to the left, we say, wait a second, there's something up here, right? Perhaps we wrote a bad test. And it always turns out that's never the case. They're always great tests. Now, always, always, right? Infallibility is one of the prerequisites to working here, so <laughs> just kidding. Um, anywho, so frequency distributions, that's where you're just counting up the, the number of values of each one you have there. What about a sample mean? How would I get that? Out of all the values and divide by what? Number of observations. What could I also call that? 
n, right? So you can divide by your n, and that would end up telling you what your sample mean is, right? Everyone knows that. And I'm not going to have you calculate it on the test, but you should know intuitively how you come up with the mean, right? It's easy enough. Uh, minimum and maximum values you can come up with there, 25th and the 75th percentiles, right? So it's kind of telling you where those sort of interquartile ranges are going to be there to kind of, uh, kind of assess how wide-ranging your data is, right? If this 25th and 75th are very close to the mean, what does that tell you? Yeah, your data is really kind of tightly packed versus if it's farther out, it means the data is a little bit more, there's more scatter there, right? What would be higher in that case? What value? Your standard deviation will be higher because that data is more kind of scattered around that mean, right? There's more variability in the data, right? And that's where you get that sample standard deviation from. Okay, so that's all well and good. That's how you would describe your sample set if you're trying to just kind of dis uh, describe it to somebody. Now, if I want to make an inference about a population, this is where my t-test comes into play. Remember that t-tests are parametric tests that you're going to be using for normally distributed data sets, okay? So one sample t-test is just comparing your sample back to the population, okay? What if I wanted to compare two groups together? Or if I said I had the placebo group and the treatment group, surgery versus non-surgery, smokers versus non-smokers, this is where I'm going to use an unpaired t-test, okay, to compare the two there. And again, when I'm comparing two groups, What's my null hypothesis? The They're the same. There's no difference between the groups, right? The t-test is going to give me a p-value. If it's less than 0.05, typically, what does that tell me? There's a difference between those groups, right? Statistically significantly different, right? Um, now, why would I use an unpaired versus a paired t-test? they're related or not. Good. So are the, are the uh, points of data, are they related to one another, OK? So for instance, if I was using twins in a study, paired or unpaired? Paired, right? Because they share traits with one another. That would be inappropriate to use an unpaired test because there's some relation between the values there. What if I was, say, for instance, um, trying to rate the performance of different ways of monitoring temperature and I was comparing, uh, say, oral temperatures to rectal temperatures in the same patients? Paired, because you're doing the values in the same patient. So if that way, if someone has a fever and they're an outlier, well, they would also be affecting that other value the same as well, right? The, all, the rectal and the oral values would both be high because it's coming from the same patient, right? Versus if I was, say, taking oral temperatures between patients who got acetaminophen versus ibuprofen, then no relation to one another, that would be unpaired, right? Very good. So understand whether or not you'd be using a paired or unpaired test based off of um, the, the description of the study. If I was using, say, like a pre and post sort of design where I would measure people for something before the study starts and then I have an intervention and I measure them after, paired or unpaired? Paired because I'm using the same people, right? So again, keep that in mind. Those are usually the most common cases uh, where you end up having a paired test, where it's a pre-post design, or if you're running, the, say, the sample in tandem, like I mentioned the oral and the rectal temperature as an example, um, again, is it fair to use, like, just enroll twins in a study? No, it's not really. I think the Nazis tried that. Uh, did not go well for anyone, right? So don't do that. Okay. I'm just saying that in the cases there, you'd use a pair <laughs> test. Sometimes you actually find um, that you may recruit like siblings for a type of study, um, uh, but you know this just depends on the study design you're actually going for. So just something to think about. Anyway, um, so now what if I wanted to say compare more than two groups? That's where ANOVA comes into play there, right? And why do we like ANOVA? Because we go to ANOVA in Orlando, yes. so that's our favorite test, obviously. Duh. Um, so again, anytime you're using more than two groups, so three or more, that's where an ANOVA comes into play. What does the ANOVA tell me? So listen to this, the analysis of variance is the name of the test, but what does it really tell me? Because what happens if I were to just keep comparing multiple groups together? Eventually you're just going to find something, right? That's called that multiple comparisons trap you fall into, where if you just keep running the data, eventually you're going to find something just due to chance alone, right? Because we're only going for a p-value of 0.05, so you run into issues with that. By running an ANOVA, what I can do is I can compare multiple groups at the same time, and what it, what it will tell me? Is there some difference amongst at least one pair of the groups? Yes or no, right? If I get a high p-value, then it would be, well, no, there's probably not a difference, right? Any differences there are just due to chance alone. I can't reject the null hypothesis. If I have an ANOVA that comes back at a low p-value, less than 0.05, it says there's a difference somewhere, but how do I find out where? You have to run multiple tests afterwards, okay? So you'd start out with just that one study where you're just looking at all the different groups, say three, four, five groups, whatever, and you're saying, like, was there a difference anywhere amongst them? 
And if you get a p-value that's low, you can say, yes, there's a difference somewhere. Now I've got to find it. Okay? How do you deal with multiple comparisons, though? Let's say I'm going to start to do this pairwise comparisons. And the more groups you include, the more pairwise comparisons you have to do. It's almost exponential. How do I account for that? You have to do a correction, right? So we talk about a, uh, a family-wise error rate. Remember, the easiest one you could do is, let's say I have to run four different comparisons. Well, I can just take my 0.05 and divide it by what? Four. four. So that way, all added up together, they all have the chance of 0.05 in order to be significant. But what does that do to each individual test's ability to find a difference? It makes the chance of that type 2. It may, well, no, you're right, you're right. I'm sorry. Yeah, type 2 error. Yeah, so it, by dividing it out, those values have to hit lower numbers in order to achieve significance. Okay? So it makes it harder to find that difference there, which means you are more likely to run to a type 2 error. Okay? But that's good because what would you rather make, type 1 or type 2 error? Type 2, type two error. I can, don't want to come, out, come away with a false conclusion and say, look at this study. This is going to change medicine, and it's a type 1 error. It's incorrect, right? Type 2 error, I can run the study again. I can get more people involved and maybe find a difference if it's there. Okay? So that's where the ANOVA comes into play. It's really helpful there. Again, that's for unpaired groups. If I needed a paired ANOVA, that's where I'm going to run into the repeated measures ANOVA. Okay? And again, that's why it says followed by multiple comparisons tests. Again, you have to make sure you're accounting for that, um, that uh, family-wise error rate. If I was running, let's say, 10 comparisons together, what would my p-value need to reach? 0 0.005, right? It's just 0.05 divided by 10, right? If I was running five comparisons, 0 0.01, right? Easy, easy uh, divisions there, okay? And again, stuff on the test, easy peasy. You don't have to calculate anything, but you may need to look, uh, kind of compare some of these values together. Uh, and again, you should be able to do the interpretation. Yes, ma'am? So if you have the 10 example that you had, you'd have to have something like point oh, or point zero zero 0.009 to be uh, enough to find a difference? So let's say I was going to do uh, five comparisons, right? So my family-wise error rate goes from changes from 0 0.05 for the entire family to 0 0.01 for each comparison. So if I got a value 0 0.009, that would be significant. Okay. But if say one of those comparisons came back 0 0.04, would it be significant? Yeah. No, right? Because again, that's probably just due to chance alone, right? The risk of that are too high, okay? That's how we uh, try to prevent making all those type one errors, but just by running multiple comparisons over and over again, okay? Very good. Um, now again, when we start to correlate values together, right? So now we can try to start predicting values from one another. Um, remember, we're trying to explain or predict. This is where we get into our simple regressions. Now, simple regression just means what? Simple means we're keeping it simple. We're only looking at two values, right? So remember in the, in the videos we're talking about, like the fatty acid content versus the insulin sensitivity? Or what if we were looking at, say, for instance, um, you know, miles run a day and resting heart rate? You could do this kind of things where you're looking to see does one value predict another, right? Can you predict y from x? That's what the simple regressions are going to be. What happens if I want to kind of factor in multiple different outcome variables? Multiple different input variables, I should say. That's where you get into the multiple linear regressions, okay? We didn't really talk about nonlinear regressions. Those get more complicated. We're just trying to look at those straight lines, right? Trying to look to see can you predict one value from another based off of those the data there, okay? Now, what would it mean? Let's say I was trying to run a, um, a simple regression. Let's say I get a value here. And let's say the line is going in this direction. The best fit line goes in that way. What does that mean? That as x goes up, what does y do? y goes up as well, right? Your r value would be what? Well, yeah, so if all the data points perfectly lined up on that line, yeah. it would be 1, right? <laughs> if it was, say, not perfect, what would it be? Positive or negative? Positive. It'd be positive, yeah. right? It'd probably be like 0.8 or 0.6, whatever the case may be, right? So imagine you see all these like, data points kind of fitting around it, right? But it should kind of line up somewhat like that. That's the best fit line we're looking at. Now, if it was, say, for instance, going to be heading in the opposite direction, is going down this direction, what does that mean? They're inversely proportional. So as x goes up, y goes down, okay? The r value here would be what? Negative, okay? Now remember, when you get an r squared value, are those ever negative? No. Why not? Because any negative value squared is what? Positive. Two negatives make a positive, as it turns out, okay? What would happen if I got a line that was just flat? This purple will show up at all. Oh, that's really bad. 
There's no correlation whatsoever. To, you cannot predict any value of y from x because they don't correlate at all. Okay. And again, when you're running those R squared or the, running those R values, what you're, when you get those p values, what it's telling you is that the null hypothesis is what? That there is no correlation, that you should just get a flat line. But the line that you do get is significantly different enough that it's unlikely due to chance alone. That's how you reject that null hypothesis there. Okay? Make sense? Very good. The nice thing when you're looking at, um, when we're talking about non-Gaussian data, we'll see that it's, there's a lot of corollaries there, so we're not going to spend quite as much time on there, but we'll look at some of the differences. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to uh, continuous data from a non-Gaussian distribution, right? So let's say we have data that is not going to be uh, normally distributed. Let's say we're looking at things like ordinal data potentially that can be potentially useful there, right? If you imagine um, kind of a Likert scale like that, you can potentially use some of these non-Gaussian data. So here, we said that the sample mean is really sensitive to outliers. What do we use instead for non-Gaussian data? Is the median, right? Why is that less sensitive to outliers? Because everything is by ranks, right? You're just kind of ranking everything from the smallest value to the highest value such that you really kind of eliminate the effect of that really high value because it's just in a rank, right? It's just right next to the next value down. Uh, and so you find that the medians are less sensitive to outliers, okay? So that also means we've got to change up how we're actually going to be looking at these values here. So again, notice we're getting a sample median instead of a sample mean for non-Gaussian data here. We're going to be looking at minimum and maximum. You can still do that in the 25th and 75th percentiles, interquartile ranges is perfectly normal. Um, now notice what we're going to see is different in the tests that we're running here. These are parametric or non-parametric tests? Non-parametric tests. If you're using non-Gaussian, non-normal, non-normally distributed data, using non-parametric tests. So we can use things like if we're making an inference about a population, so say a sample and referring back to the population, that's a Wilcoxon rank sum test. If you're using two unmatched, unpaired groups, now this is normally distributed, what test would you use? Two unmatched groups? So we use an unpaired t-test. The non-parametric version of this is the Mann-Whitney test. And then if you're comparing two matched groups, so instead of a paired t-test, you can use the Wilcoxon matched pairs test. Now I will tell you, I still have trouble remembering which of these go with it? Because like a t-test, unpaired, paired. Makes sense, right? Do I care who Wilcoxon is or Mann and Whitney are? I do not, no. right? I'm not a biostatistician. I don't really care. However, you still need to be able to recognize that. So if you're looking at a, an article and they say, hey, we ended up using, um, we, we ran a normality test and we were uh, we rejected all hypothesis and we said this is not normally distributed data, we went ahead and ran a Mann-Whitney test. Okay, that makes sense. But if they said, hey, this is not normally distributed, but we ran a t-test. Should that raise red flags? Yes. If they're using parametric tests on non-normally distributed data, they're more likely to find what? To find a difference, to make a type 1 error. Okay? It's harder to achieve significance with these tests because you're giving yourself, you're making it more robust, right? You're making it so it's more difficult, but when you do find a conclusion, you're more likely to say, yes, this is actually true. Okay? And a lot of times, like so for instance, in my study that I did for my fellowship, um, I didn't really run a normality test. Instead, what could I do? I could just fall back and say, well, well I'm not going to test for normality. What I can go ahead and do, because it was a kind of a convenient sample, I said, well, I'm just going to go ahead and look at, uh, I'm just going to uh, assume it's non-parametric. I'm going to assume it's non-normally distributed. Okay? Now, what does that increase my chances of making? type 2 error because it's harder to achieve significance, but if I do find something, I can be more assured that yes, this is probably going to be correct, okay? And I'll probably bring up like my research just because that's my experience with it and kind of illustrate because again, I had to go through and think like, okay, well, how am I actually going to design this? What kind of test am I going to run? Now, do you think I did all the math for my stats? Yes. Heck no. <laughs> no. I didn't know how to run SAS and all that nonsense. No, I went to a biostatistician. I said, here's what I want to do. And he says, okay. And he crunched the numbers, handed it back to me, and then I had to interpret it. Tough. Tough stuff, but again, I don't actually do the math myself, so that's kind of the difference there. I should have tried to like keep the illusion going, like of course I did in my head. Obviously, I can calculate p-values to the nth decimal. No, um, they're not that good. Anywho, so some other things we can look at. What about survival curves, right? What do survival curves help us with? Certainly can help with looking at survival, but what else? You look at five-year survival, sure. You're looking at what's what's unique about death, though? It can only happen once. It can only happen once. <laughs> Unless you're James Bond. 
unless you're James Bond. Thank you very much. <laughs> or if maybe you are I'm trying to think of Highlander, then it can never happen unless you get your head lopped off. Maybe there's some other instances. However, no Highlander fans? Nothing? It can be only one. I guess that's me. Um, look it up. Uh, anyway. <laughs> So survival curves are nice because it can be applied to things that only happen once, okay? So for instance, if you have recurrence of cancer, maybe an example there, right? Look at other things like um, time to REM sleep. Once it happens, boom, then that's it, okay? Looking at things like time to end of cold symptoms. Once that cold is done, then it's done, okay? Now notice here, if it could be something that perhaps could happen multiple times, you're only going to count it for that first time it happens for that particular patient, and then they're out, they're done, okay? So why don't I use, you know, and when you're looking at these, you'll see they end up coming up with like median survival times. Why do they use median instead of mean survival times? Well, I have to run studies really long periods of time in a lot of cases, right? So to get the mean survival time, what do I have to have happen? Well, for mean, I have to have everyone die in order to get what the actual value is, right? So, right, but for median, how many people do I need to have die? Only 50%, or I only need 50% of the actual events to occur in the population in order, or the sample is actually to, to make a conclusion at that point. So again, it's nicer because I don't have to sit there and wait around for the event to occur in every single patient, right? Because studies, they only get run for so long, you can't run them indefinitely unless you got magical funding for that or you have something you're really just interested in following forever, but that's hard to do, okay? So that's why we look at median survival times. Um, now again, when you're comparing um, you know, a sample to a population, you can develop survival curves. So if you remember looking at some of those graphs there, you can find kind of those banded patterns together. But you can also make comparisons amongst groups too, right? So I could compare different cancer treatment groups. I can say here's standard cancer treatment versus this new experimental treatment. And I can actually compare the curves together to see are they statistically significantly different? Are the median survival times different in these groups here, then maybe the new experimental treatment has better mortality, right? Maybe I should be using this as the new standard of care for those patients there. And so this is where you can end up running those kind of tests there, okay? So just know why we would use a survival curve, what type of values would be appropriate for survival curve, and they're really only going to be things that can happen once, and then the patient's done, okay? What happens if I want to say, for instance, I'm looking at um, can like deaths due to cancer, but then someone dies in a car wreck? Do I include them or not? Yes. Okay. What do you call it when you include all those people, even if they didn't really have the outcome you were looking for? It's called intention to treat. So even though the car wreck may seem unrelated, you still include them in your data set, right? Now, what does that make it more likely to have, have happen? You can skew your data. Maybe you're a lot more likely to find something. Maybe you're more likely to find nothing, right? Um, but it skews your data. What happens if I were to say, take that patient out of it? What do you call that? You're censoring the patient, right? You're censoring that bit of data. Now, is that appropriate to censor data? It can be, right? It depends. You have to make sure that you're being very clear about that when you're reading the article. Say, hey, we censored these data points because of X, Y, and Z, and then you as the reader can interpret or interpret, say, does that make sense or not, okay? So that's kind of the big thing with that one is that, uh, and oftentimes what they'll do is they'll do an intention to treat analysis and then a censored data analysis, and they'll compare the two together. And if they're similar, then you can say, okay, well, it probably doesn't really matter so much about those few data points they censored, okay? Make sense? <clears throat> okay. Uh, if we were looking at, say, binomial comparisons, right? When I say binomial, what does that mean? There's just two values yes, no. Cat, dog. Red and blue, right? So in those cases, there, you, most often it's like yes or no sort of phenomenon, right? So dead or alive. You could do those things here. So if you're just looking at one sample, you could look at a proportion of the yeses to the noes, right? Or vice versa. If you wanted to make an inference, you can actually develop these kind of binomial tests. I wouldn't worry so much about these. The one thing I do want you to know is when you're doing, say, for instance, um, uh, an unpaired group, so you're trying to match two groups together, two unpaired groups, this is what we call a Fisher's exact test. You can actually compare the two together to see, oh, are these proportions of yeses to noes different, statistically different between the two groups here, okay? It's called Fisher's exact test. I'm trying to think, do I have something about the chi-square? Um, this is kind of related to the chi-square test. You guys remember what chi-square is? What is that? The so square belong to chi? No, that's when you're looking at the frequency of something to see like, well, is this occurring in the rates that I would expect to see if it was just not really related to anything or is it occurring significantly different from that? Um, so you're looking at expected versus observed values. 
By comparing those two together, you can see is there a statistically significant difference? And that's what the chi-square is used for. So if you recall the example I used in the video, we talked about where firefighters are dying, right? So assuming there's no influence on what firefighters do throughout the day, they should be dying at random times throughout the day. It doesn't matter what they're doing. So they looked at what they would expect to see if there was no true uh, difference there. And what they actually found, what did they find? They're much more likely to die during active fire management, right? And they're actually re uh, responding to a call. And so that's what the chi-square can do is to look at the observed versus the expected frequencies and see if there's a real difference there, okay? All right. Any questions so far? See the steam slowly releasing from your ears? It's all good. So let's look at an article real quick before we go on a break here. So the bones of an article, what does that mean? What are the different parts of an article? What kind of makes up, right? So um, what are the different component pieces that come together when you're actually reading a piece of medical literature, right? Because all of you are going to be well-versed at reading medical literature by the time you get out of here. Yes. You'll have zero choice about it because that's what your grad project one's going to be. We have a whole course about this in the summer. Don't you worry. You're going to get very good at it, as it turns out. Um, now, why do we read the medical literature? Why would we do this? I just had to read the medical literature because I had this crazy leech order and I said, well, why in the heck would they do that? I looked it up. You know how I found that? Googled it. Said <laughs> so leeches. Applied to penis and scrotum. And guess what I came up with? And yeah, does it screw up my Google searches in the future? Yeah. <laughs> of course it does. That's OK. But I found the article. I found a recent article link me to the New England Journal of Medicine. And guess what? And now I know why they would do that, potentially. There's one cause for it. So sometimes you just don't know the answer to something, and it's a very good reason to look up the medical literature, right? Now again, can Google take you to some disreputable sources? <laughs> no. Yeah. If it's like naturalhealthystuff.ru or something, like maybe that may not be super appropriate, but as long as you know where to find the right data, that's uh, the right literature, that's, that's the important thing here. I'll show you some examples of that. But again, if there's a new active health problem, right? What if we had like a potentially a new strain of flu that came out this uh, this winter time? We need to ed educate ourselves to take care of our patients, right? This is where the medical literature comes into play. We're looking at, say, new treatment guidelines. We're looking at a new new drug that's coming out for a particular disease state. We, we can look at the literature to help us out with this. But most frequently, I think you're going to be looking at it when you either educate yourself on how to manage a patient or you're looking for, say, new updates on that sort of thing there. Because um, patients are going to come in sometimes with a disease that you've never heard of, and you say, well, I have no idea what that is. And is that what you say to the patient? You say, um, let me go look that up real quick. And you go, and you look it up, and you come back, and then you know how to hand, manage that patient. And very frequently, you're going to be asked on rotations, your, your preceptor is going to say, well, what about this? And what are you going to say if you don't know the answer? Let me get back to you on that. Let me go look that up, please. Do you say, maybe it's this? Kind of like yesterday, a little bit, during grand rounds? I heard a lot of that. I heard a lot of four? That's not a good way to answer questions, right? You don't want your shoulders to go up and your voice to go up. You want to be definitive. Say, hey, I actually don't know the answer to that. Please let me go look that up and I'll get back to you, right? And then actually follow up. That's the other important piece of that. A lot of people don't do that second piece. Um, so anywho, so that's the reason why we go and look through the literature here. Um, when you're actually looking at the pieces of an article, are any of you like really well versed at looking at the medical literature yet? Okay, good. That's a good starting point for everyone because you have no preconceptions, so I can can't break into it. So these are the, the, the different components. We're going to look at the abstract or the summary of the article. There's going to be the introduction, the materials and methods, the results, the discussion, and then finally the references. Okay. So these are the different components you're going to be looking into. We're going to break into each one of these individually here. So what does the summary of the abstract do for us? It sums everything up, right? It's a nice, concise bit. And so I kind of think about this as like, like an online dating profile. It's a nice little int introductory thing that's going to get someone interested in that profile to click on, to maybe swipe, I don't know, which way do you swipe? <laughs> right or left? I don't know. Do you like them or not? Like, if you, I really want to read this article. <laughs> Alright, you swipe to the right, right? So I say, alright, I really want to read this article, right? Or whatever it happens to be. Kind of think about it like being an introductory sort of thing. It's kind of wetting your appetite. Like, oh, I, this actually looks like a good article. I want to dive further. <laughs> Now, unfortunately, I have a lot of people who will just read the abstract and they say, all right, I got it. This is everything I need to know about this article. Do not be abstract readers and go back to your preceptor and be like, all right, well, the abstract said this. And then, well, what about X, Y, and Z detail of the article? And you'll be like, um, the abstract didn't talk about that. <laughs> the abstract is meant to be an introduction to get you interested in the article to read further, okay? 
actually, I, I, you guys know my wife is a pharmacist as well, and she came up with this article she showed me, and I was like, oh yeah, well, uh, what about what about this detail? And she was just like, uh, I don't know. I was like, did you just read the abstract? And boy, she did not like that question. <laughs> she was very upset. <laughs> Yeah, she, she didn't like that. She said, uh, you can go read the abstract out on the couch. I was like, okay. <laughs> anyway, um, so like I said, this is supposed to be concise, good information, but it's supposed to get you interested. It's just showing you the very salient points. They say, what is the problem they're looking at? How do they look at it? What were the results? And then finally, what kind of concluding thoughts they have with that? It should be relatively short, basically a paragraph or two. Um, you're going to find every journal will be a little different in terms of what they're looking for for their abstract. Some may be very structured, some may be not so structured. Just depends. But most of the time, when you're going through PubMed, does everyone know how to get to PubMed? I want you to know this. You go to the Nova Library website, you can go to databases, you click on the P and you get to PubMed. That's one way to do it, right? So PubMed, you search for an article, it'll come up with something. Usually the abstract will be the first thing that'll be listed there. And then if you want to get more details, then you can go and find that. We'll talk more about that later on. Um, next up, they're going to have the introduction. This is typically going to be able to get you up to speed on a topic, right? So if they're looking at a new drug treatment, they're probably going to break into saying like, well, here's this disease state, here's why we care about treating it, and maybe here's what the standards have been, and here's why we want to do this, use this new treatment. That's where they're kind of getting you up to speed, the rationale for the study, and oftentimes they'll talk about previous literature. So for example, when I did my study, I'm sure everyone's read it already, but um, what I was doing, I was actually comparing, uh, comparing um, treatment of coral snake envenomations, whether we should do like a watch and wait approach or whether we should give everyone antivenom right off the bat. My introduction was kind of talking about, well, why is this a problem? Why do we need to worry about coral snake antivenom? because it's not being made anymore, and then getting into, well, what have previous treatment strategies done? Why do we even care about coral snakes? X, Y, and Z, okay? That's the introduction, kind of breaking you into the topic itself. The methodology, what do you think this talks about? How they ran the study. This is super, super important to be able to, to speak to this kind of details here. And so this is where they're gonna talk about the population they looked at. This is gonna talk about how they recruited people into their study. We'll talk about inclusion and exclusion criteria. What do you think inclusion criteria is? What factors do patients have to meet in order to be included in your study? What about exclusion criteria? They can't have these things, otherwise they're, they're knocked out, right? So for instance, if you're doing a, pre, uh, a, pay, a study on pregnant women, what might be an exclusion criteria? If not pregnant or if you're a male, right? Get out of here, done. <laughs> That's an exclusion criteria, okay? So it's important they're very explicit about who they included and who they did not include in there. And they'll talk about data collection techniques, they'll talk about how they actually measured things, they'll talk about how, uh, what sort of analytics they're gonna do afterwards, so they should be saying a priori, here are the types of statistical tests we're gonna do on this data, okay? A lot of people will skip over this, because is, is this like the super interesting bit of the reading? No. no, it's really boring, it's really dry stuff. But you need to know how they ran the study to understand and interpret the actual results. Very easy just to read the introduction, say, okay, that's interesting, and then go to the conclusions and be like, okay, I know everything I need to know about this. Not the case. You gotta read the research uh, methods here. Okay, and then the results tell us what? What do they find, right? This is where you get the tables and figures, this is where you end up getting uh, your p-values get reported out, your confidence intervals, all that stuff is gonna be there. Everything you should be able to take away from the article, you should be able to pick up from the results. The methods and the results should be able to tell you everything you need to know. Because the authors will come to their own conclusion, but is that conclusion always going to be the same as your conclusion? Not necessarily. So it's important to be able to delineate that. Sometimes authors have um, uh, preconceived notions. Sometimes they have uh, they can come to false conclusions. You know, how do we how do we prevent kind of like bad science from being put into journals? Peer review, peer review right? However, is that a foolproof process? Not always, right? When I say peer review, what does that mean? reviewed by someone else who's an expert in the field, right? So for instance, uh, when I had my article peer reviewed, I submitted it to the journal, it was clinical toxicology was the journal, and then that got disseminated out to other people who are presumably experts in coral snake envenomation. Not a lot of those, but presumably, at least someone who knew something about snake bites, right? And so they reviewed that. Do you think I knew who that, those people were? Why not? I don't want to call them up and be like, hey, that article's pretty good, right? Like, just, uh, put, put it through, it's all good. But they would go ahead and send uh, anonymous feedback to me saying, hey, I think you should probably shore this up. I think this is probably a bad conclusion, X, Y, and Z. And they'll go they would revise it, turn it back in, go through another peer review process until they finally accepted it. Now, at any point, they can just say, no, we don't want this and reject it, but that's the, the normal process for the review. So I send it to them, they review it, it's peer reviewed, so that way you can hopefully weed out a lot of bad articles. Now, is every journal peer reviewed? 
No, there's some article, there's some journals you can just pay money to, and they'll just publish whatever you want. That's not great science. But we'll talk about ways, in, uh, especially in the summer, uh, we'll talk about ways you can find really good journals and how you find the bad journals, okay? Okay, and then discussion or comments where the authors are going to kind of put their own um, two cents on the topic. They're going to say, here's what we found. Here's why we uh, think this might be important or not so important. They will also talk about the strengths and weaknesses of their article, right? So what do you think might be some weaknesses they might talk about? Yeah, maybe they didn't have a very good sample size. Maybe they had to stop the study early. Maybe they had to, uh, maybe, they, you know, something changed partway through the study that could have been a problem. They should be addressing all these things, right? Talk about the strengths of the article as well, if they have any. Uh, and then this is going to be probably the most speculative because they're also going to say, well, here's what we think should be done in the future, right? Here's what we think future uh, potential uh, avenues of research could be. You know, here's how we might do it if we ran the study again, X, Y, and Z. And then finally, should have the references of bibliography. What does this include? All the stuff they cited, right? So the stuff that they were using to inform their information or their article, namely like the introduction, things like that, that's where they're going to be including all of this, right? This can be really helpful if you're doing a research project, which you'll be doing relatively soon, like in the summertime. Um, you're going to be seeing that uh, the references are a really nice place to go down sort of that rabbit hole where you kind of read one article, is really good, you go down to the next article and then you go to their reference section, you go down another article, and it's kind of like Inception a little bit, where you kind of go yes. deeper, 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 and then you have to hear the boom, and then bring yourself back out, because yes. you get lost down that rabbit hole way too easily sometimes. So anyway, so that's a really important thing to, to look at as well, and usually you'll be able to get like kind of direct links to there, which is handy. So how should you approach articles? I mean, are you going to read every single journal article that ever comes out? Of course not. It's ridiculous. There's way too much stuff out there. However, where you end up going to specialize, you'll probably end up reading a lot of stuff uh, coming out about that. So if you're into surgery, you might read like the annals of surgery, right? If you go to work in clinical toxicology or emergency medicine, you're probably going to read emergency medicine. You're going to be reading clinical toxicology. You're going to be reading all these big uh, journals in that field because that's where they're publishing the most kind of influential stuff. Because that's going to change your practice. And so it's important to be selective about what you read because you, you just can't read it all, right? Um, and again, if you're like, say, for instance, working pediatrics, are you going to really care about adult studies? Probably not because you just don't see that many adult patients, right? So again, you have to be very selective about that. And again, you're going to be looking over, gauging the article based off of where it's coming from, how they ran the study, et cetera, in order to determine is it actually any good or not, okay? Uh, again, concentrate on the methods. Most people skip this, but this is how you need to know how they actually included or excluded uh, their, their patients because, again, you need to figure out, does this apply to your patients, right? So, for instance, if a study was done where their uh, study was done in Thailand, but you're working in Florida, are those study results going to be appropriate to your patients? Maybe, maybe not, right? So this is why you have to take everything with a grain of salt to be like, okay, well, where's the study run, right? Who funded the study? Things like that can maybe influence the results, and so you should be able to be, be able to interpret that. If you say, well, I don't think this will really have a big impact on where they ran the study, then okay, then you can keep going. Or if it's something that completely excludes it, or whatever. So for instance, if I was reading a study and I was curious about coral snake bites in Florida, well, are the, you know, say green mambas or black mambas over in Africa, are those applicable to coral snakes? Not really, right? There may be some crossover, but it's not directly relatable. And so in those cases there, that's why you need to know inclusion, exclusion criteria and whatnot. Now, if I treated a black mamba bite over here, I have. Pretty cool. But that's a story for another day. I have to keep you coming back to my classes. So. <laughs> I can't tell you it all now. Okay, so any questions on that? Let's do a 10 minute break. We'll come back and then talk about study designs. One question up here. Uh, this is a very good one. So, so does the flat line represent the null hypothesis? I'm very uh, confused as to what the null hypothesis means. So at a baseline, what is the null hypothesis? If I'm comparing two things together, there's no difference between the two, right? That means that the, they come from identical sample set. That means there's no difference between those two there. So if we're saying we're looking at a correlation, and again, if we're looking at a correlation between two different values, right? So we have our graph here. We're comparing X and Y. And let's say we have all the data points that are kind of scattered around. If there is no difference between the two values, if you cannot correlate X to Y, how does that represent in the data? It would be completely scattered at total random between the two because the two values have nothing to do with one another uh, together. So if I say, for instance, looked at uh, the color car you drove, I guess that's not a good example. Let's say I did um, your shoe size versus your IQ. Does anyone think there's a correlation between those two? 
okay, I see one on affirmative. <laughs> it could be. I have no idea. I haven't run the study. But let's say for the sake of argument uh, that there's no correlation between the two there, that, uh, that shoe size has no effect on IQ. Although that would be much smarter if that was the case. Right? <laughs> pretty big feet, as it turns out. <laughs> anyway, um, not the biggest, but bigger than average. I just have to get, I have to go to specialty shoe stores, is what I'm trying to say, okay? <laughs> Don't bring it up, it's not a big deal. Um, okay, so let's say there's no correlation between shoe size and IQ. That line, if that's a null hypothesis, it would be represented by a flat line. Because it doesn't matter what shoe size I'm looking at in terms of the x-axis, the y-axis of IQ would have no difference, right? So if you were to see that in terms of scatter, it would be completely scattered at total random. It would look like a like buckshot or something, right? It would be, there's no discernible pattern to it, okay? Now let's say we ran the experiment. We did find there was a correlation between the two. People who had bigger shoe sizes did have higher IQs. So at that point, what would the line look like? It'd be going diagonally up to the right, right? So you end up seeing it look something like this, okay? So that, such that as the shoe size got bigger, so did the IQ start to go up as well, right? We would, in that case there, because the R value would come back, say 0 0.6, 0 0.7, something like that, we would be able to reject the null hypothesis that the line is flat and say, no, that's not true. It is very unlikely that the data that we have that shows this line, this best fit line, is due to chance alone. There is a correlation between the two. Now, because we find a correlation, does that say that because you have big feet, that has caused you to have a larger IQ? Because you had to find out and learn where all the specialty shoe shop shops are? No. Correlation does not equal causation, right? If I did a regression, then I may be able to find out how do I predict Y from X and say, well, how much of the, uh, the variability is predicted from shoe size, okay? Now, let's say on the other hand, he said the bigger shoes you have, the... Uh, lower your IQ was. Let's say that we did find that data there. How would that look? Maybe down diagonal to the right here. Okay, that would be saying that as shoe size goes up, what happens to your IQ? Now there may be some evidence to back this up. Let's look at the example of clowns. <laughs> Do clowns are they very smart? <laughs> Who's to say? <laughs> they certainly seem foolish. But if we did find that data, we would say, okay, well, it appears that as shoe size goes up as you start to get to, say, Pennywise and Bozo and whoever else, that your IQ has now started to go down. It's a correlation with that. Then we say, well, no, we're going to reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference and that we, there, there's a flat line. We're rejecting that and saying that, yes, this diagonal line is unlikely to be due to chance alone. Okay, there's a correlation there. Does that make sense? Hopefully I answered that person's question with that very silly analogy. All right, so we're going to leave it there. Any other questions I can address here? Nothing else. Let's continue on. Let's talk about study design. How do we actually design studies? There's a few different ways we can do this. Uh, there's going to be what we call descriptive studies and then more explanatory studies. Uh, descriptive studies do what? They describe something, absolutely. So again, is there any sort of like experimental change that the, per the, the researcher is implementing? No, they're just observing things, right? So this is where, for instance, uh, say like you went on to your clinical rotations and you have a patient that comes in with just a disease state that's like you've never even heard of before, something crazy. And you say, wow, this is really interesting. This is very rare. I want to go ahead and publish this. That, again, does not tell you anything about how to treat that disease. It does not tell you anything about um, the population of everyone that has the disease. It is purely descriptive or observatory, you're going to find this what we call something like a case report, right? Case reports typically have an N of what? N of one, right? It's just one person you're doing that case report in, right? Now, if I have multiple cases together, what do you call that? It's a series of cases. You call it a case series. So if you had, say, several people come in with the same uh, disease state that was very rare, then you could say, okay, here's a case series. So, for example, I was on rotation uh, in the PICU when I was doing my fellowship, and we found this patient. Uh, remember, we were talking about treatment of C. diff, right? What is kind of the, the mainstay of treatment now for C. diff? Which route? Oral vanco, right? Oral vanco is kind of the, the gold standard for adults now. Uh, we were actually using uh, oral vancomycin for uh, a young child who had um, pseudomembranous colitis, secondary to having a ton of different infections, being all these antibiotics, because she had a bone marrow transplant. She was severely immunosuppressed. And so what was interesting is that normally vanco, does it get absorbed through the GI tract? No, it's too big of a molecule, right? 
Well, this patient, she had severe inflammation in her GI tract. She also had renal failure, right? How does Vanco get eliminated from the body? Renally, all right? So we decided, well, she had renal failure. She had this really inflamed uh, GI tract. We're like, well, let's, let's just do a level and see what it comes back as. And normally you'd expect the level to be what? Zero, right? Because it shouldn't be absorbed. However, she had an actual therapeutic level, getting no IV vancomycin. So we thought that was really novel. It was really interesting. So what we did is we made a case report out of it because it was a case of just one person. Okay. So again, our N was one. We did not kind of find any new uh, data about the disease state. We did not actually do any kind of experiments with that patient. We just said, wow, this is sure is interesting. Let's go ahead and, and publish this. And we actually did get it published, right? So that's something you could do if you see something interesting like that on rotations potentially. And we encourage that sort of thing there. Anyway, so that's one thing you'll see. Going to the explanatory, this is where you may be uh, doing more observational studies, but you're going to be grouping people based on certain things. We'll look at the different studies, design types, or it could be experimental where you're actually implementing some sort of new treatment or some sort of new uh, intervention, as we'll see. So as I mentioned, descriptive studies, they're just recording the events. They don't provide any detailed explanations of the cases. Uh, and again, they don't give you any ideas on how you should maybe manage that case in the future, right? Um, however, they may be a good jumping off point for, say, more or say more exhaustive studies, right? Maybe you say, wow, this is really interesting. We did a case series where we saw this in 12 people. Maybe we should do further research, right? Maybe we should do a sort of uh, explanatory study. And so those are where those are jumping off points. So they're interesting, but they're not necessarily going to give you an idea of how to manage your, your patients, right? So again, very, very useful for novel things. For more explanatory studies, this is where we start to make comparisons between the two. This is where we can start to actually use our descriptive um, or uh, inferential statistics to actually come up with ideas of how we can compare groups together and see, okay, well, is, you know, is, is a certain risk factor associated with disease? Is this treatment associated with better outcomes? This is where we can start to do that. Okay, so we'll talk about experimental and then observational studies. What do you think the difference between the two is, though? Yeah, when I'm just watching the patients, I may group them up based on something and then watch them. The other experiment will be what? I'm actually making an intervention. I'm actually doing something with those groups and then seeing what happens. Okay, I'll give you some examples as we go forward. So again, looking at an explanatory study, here's an experimental one. This is a controlled clinical trial. When I say controlled trial, what does that mean? Yeah, so it could be placebo control, but basically you have a control group, right? So you have a group who's going to be considered to be your control, who's kind of the baseline, and then you have your experimental group, which should be getting an intervention, okay? So it could be placebo control. Say I'm trying out a new antihypertensive drug, and I have one group getting just sugar pills, and I have the other group getting the actual active drug. That could be a placebo-controlled trial. Or say, for instance, I was having um, one group of patients get the standard of care for something, and then I have this other experimental arm. That could be controlled, right? That's what we were referring to there. But basically, there's an active intervention here. So how you would actually diagram this out would be if we have a study population, you break them out into the control group and the experimental group, and then you look to see what the disease outcome is in the end, or whatever outcome you're actually looking at. If you're looking at reduction of blood pressure, mortality, whatever the case may be. Bless you. Now, if you're looking at this, would this be considered a prospective or a retrospective study, looking at the timeline, the present, into the future? Prospective. Anytime you're starting out with a group of people and then you're following them moving forward in time, that is a prospective study. If you're following people backwards in time, that's called what? Retrospective, right? If you're looking into the past to see what happened, that's called retrospective studies there. Which ones do you think provide us kind of with more confidence in the idea that a study is like really robust and we can actually apply this to other patients? Prospective, right? If you're doing an actual experimental study, we're doing an intervention and we're looking forward to see how patients do, prospective studies give us much better ideas of what is actually true, right? We can get more cause and effect from a prospective study, okay? So when you talk about like a randomized controlled trial, those are kind of the highest levels of evidence we have for something being true or not. You could, right? But oftentimes we can't necessarily, oh, we'll talk about those in a second, right? So I'll, I'll be more um, clear uh, in just a few moments here. But basically this will be the highest level of evidence we have in this case when we're actually following forward. Um, the problem is when you're looking at retrospective studies, um, you already know who has the outcome and who doesn't, right? What you're doing here is instead is you're actually grouping people, you're causing intervention, and then you're following them forward in time to see what actually happens to them. So in these cases here, we're actually already starting off with a disease state, and then looking backwards, you can't really control for that necessarily, right? So again, because we're looking at new outcomes of things, that gives us a better idea of what's actually happening in these patients. And so um, you have better control over this. However, do you think these are easy studies to run or harder studies? Harder. 
much more difficult, right? So for instance, in my research I was talking about the fellowship, that was an observational study, but it was a retrospective study, right? It's when I was looking backwards in time because, you know, um, in terms of toxicology, do you think it's ethical that I go ahead and take a bunch of coral snakes and I envenomate a bunch of people and then I give some of them anti-venom and some of them not? Probably not. I tried. They just wouldn't let me. I was like, what if I use like uh, the, the, the pharmacy school students I have here? And they said, no, no good. Their lives are expendable, sure, but no, can't do it. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, so I had to look retrospectively, right? So basically I was looking backwards in time to see kind of what happened here. If I did forwards in time, though, I can have much better control of the study and I can have, I can randomize people to different groups. I can actually find out what would happen by, based on the intervention that I performed, okay? As I mentioned, observational studies are going to be usually be comparison or uh, making comparisons to examine or try to explain things that we don't know in terms of uh, the you know, medicine. And so typically you're going to find the researchers are going to be the bystanders. Now, if I were to say blinded, anyone know what that means? Obvious, uh, the obvious things aside, right? Not like taking patients and <laughs> jamming them in the eyes, right? What does blinded mean? Yeah, certain people don't know. Who's actually being involved in the study? Who's getting placebo? Who's not? If they're an experimental arm or if they're in the control group. Um, so, for instance, if it is single blinded, who is blinded? The patient does not know, right? And what does that help to control for? Placebo effect, right? So, if I don't know what I'm getting, I can't really have a placebo effect because I don't know if I'm getting an active drug or not, right? So, it kind of helps to minimize that. Um, if it's double blinded, the person running the study would not know at that point, right? So the primary, the, the physicians or PAs or whoever is actually observing the patients, they would not know who's in the experimental group or who's in the control group. What, is, what kind of benefit does that provide? Hmm? It helps to eliminate that bias for sure. Because again, if I knew someone was in the treatment group, I may be more likely to look at their, their physical exam or whatever and say, okay, well, it looks like, me. well, maybe this could be kind of equivocal, but I'm gonna say, yeah, probably, yes, this looks like the drug's working, right? Or vice versa. So it helps to eliminate some of that bias there. So if you see double-blinded controlled trials, that's what they're talking about. Is, you know, who knows who's in the actual treatment group? You know, it's really, it's crazy because like, you have to actually keep really, really tight control on that. Only very few people are allowed to know who's in the treatment group and who's in the um, who's in the control group. So for instance, if we were doing a drug trial where some people are getting placebo and some people are getting active drug, who do you think would need to know who's getting what? The pharmacist. So we have to prepare the drugs. We need to know which ones to pull. In some cases we can actually still be blind because we'll have like a certain like a package that we'll have to pull say, okay, this patient gets this number and we don't know what it is. But if we actually are preparing some of that drug, we do need to know. It was interesting. We had one study where it was a, a rare disease uh, called uh, SMA or spinal muscular atrophy. Um, and we actually were using an intrathecal drug. Is it intrathecal? What does that mean? Apply directly into the spinal cord. So basically, we have to do a lumbar puncture and administer the drug. And we were actually able to do a placebo controlled trial. And so, what was really tough is we actually prepare the drug, and the parents knew, the pharmacy knew if the patient was getting a real drug or not, but they knew that no one else knew. So, anytime we would come down to deliver the drug, they'd be like, so. Is it a real drug or not? And be like, I can't say anything. And they'd be looking like, wait, you blink twice. I think that means they're getting an active drug. I mean, they really want to know because their kids have this like debilitating medical disease. They want to know, is my child actually getting an active drug, right? I was watching um, Dallas, I promise this is relevant. I was watching okay. Dallas Buyers Club and they were um, <laughs> about AIDS mm -hmm. and how some people were getting the AZT and others were not. So then people who were, and, and the AZT wasn't working so well, so they were like going, how do you like, I feel like that's really unethical. Mm -hmm. And so when, when did that movie take place? It was in the 80s. Right. 80s. So absolutely. So again, you have to look at things like what is the gold standard, what is ethical, and what is not ethical. Does anyone know like how who actually monitors that, who referees whether the study is ethical or not? The IRB. Stands for Institutional Review Board. And basically, they're a group of people who are made up of medical professionals, lay people, um, people in the community that will help to decide is this at the study ethical or not to run. So, back in the 80s, we didn't really have an idea of what was standard treatment or not because everything was brand new, right? So, we didn't know AZT was actually going to be effective or not. So, in that case, there, it made sense to run the study where, okay, we'll do placebo controlled and say, we'll try that versus AZT, right? That's the only drug we had at the time. Nowadays, though, could you run that same trial? No, because we, ab we absolutely know without a doubt that giving antiretroviral therapy to patients with HIV helps them live for longer. But what if I wanted to test a new drug? What could I do? Standard. standard of care versus a new experimental treatment. We do that for cancer all the time. We'll have standard of care for a particular type of tumor, and then we have an experimental group, right? Because you can't withhold chemotherapy. You guys are 
snapping me up here. <laughs> Please be gentle if you meme me. That's all I ask. <laughs> Anywho, so point being is that they look at that sort of thing there, right? And so, but that was a question I had too. I was like, wait a second, we're giving like a sham lumbar puncture to these patients there? Like there's inherent risk with giving someone a lumbar puncture if you're not giving them the actual drug. But patients would need to know. I mean, like they'd be able to tell if they didn't really get a lumbar puncture, right? So again, that's one of those things where it was uh, such that it went through the IRB. They decided that, yes, we took the right precautions and everything was, you know, they crossed all their T's and dotted their I's and said, okay, this is going to be appropriate and this is how we're going to run the study. Uh, and so, yes, that is always a question. Ethics is absolutely the first thing that we'll get a study canned is if it does not meet this really strict criteria, right? Okay. Any other questions regarding that? Okay, so anyway, continuing on, uh, when you're doing these explanatory studies of an observational nature, again, the researchers are just kind of observing what's happening. They have no active input on what's happening here, but they do classify and sort of sort the data, right? So I can sort patients based on presence or absence of a risk factor. I can uh, base them on whether or not they have a disease state or not, whatever the case may be. The researchers have that ability to do that. They're just not having any direct effect on the actual patients themselves. They're only observing there, okay? We'll follow, uh, there's three main types we'll talk about. There's going to be the case control, follow-up, and then cross-sectional. Basically, with a case control design, these typically are going to be retrospective studies most frequently. This is going to be where you already have patients who you have the disease that you're curious about, so they already have the outcome. So say, for instance, you're curious about the effects of lung um, smoking on lung cancer. Well, I would want to start with patients if I was doing a, a cohort study, I'm sorry, a case control study, where I was going to be looking at patients who already had lung cancer. And then what I do is I control them with people who do not have lung cancer. Okay? Now, when I say control them, what do you think I'm going to be looking for in those controls? They're going to be people who are similar in terms of age, gender, socioeconomic status. It could be a lot of different things, but they don't have lung cancer. So lung cancer, and very frequently you find you have... Um, because, again, there are fewer people with lung cancer than not, typically there's going to be multiple control patients for every single case patient that you have. Maybe three, maybe five, it could be whatever the study design decides. So you have multiple people being hooked up with these cases, and then you look backwards in time and you see who has the risk factor. Okay. So very frequently you're going to see odds ratios get ends, up, uh, ends up being used for these. So you're looking to see who has the risk factor, and then were people who have lung cancer, were they more likely to be smokers? than people who did not have lung cancer. And obviously you would be able to say that, yes, right? Now, would it make sense? Do I give a bunch of people, um, do I, you know, say take people and, you know, 100 people, 50 of them, and say, you smoke a whole bunch and then you guys don't smoke at all, and see who gets lung cancer? I couldn't do that, right? Couldn't say. However, could I do a study where maybe I take people who are already smokers and people who are not smokers and then, say, follow them forward in time to see if they develop lung cancer? You could do that, right? So you, because you know, people are free to do whatever they want, they fall into that smoking group. Which one of these do you think would be harder to do? The prospective or the retrospective study? The prospective study is going to be much more difficult because, again, it's going to require time and money, et cetera. Here, I can just look at case. I can look at charts, right, basically do these kind of uh, these case control studies, right? I can just look backwards in time and see, okay, well, what actually happened? Do these people have a risk factor or not? The important thing to note is you're starting out here with whether or not they have the disease state, and then you follow them backwards in time to see do they have the risk factor, okay? That's going to be a case control study. On the flip side of that, you have a follow-up design, or this is oftentimes what we'll also call a cohort study, okay? A cohort study is basically going to take your study population, you're then going to classify them based on a risk factor, and then you follow them to see do they have the disease outcome. Very frequently, these are going to be prospective, so I could uh, uh, classify people as either being smokers or non-smokers, now again, is this observatory still? Yes, because I'm not having any direct intervention on the groups. I'm just classifying them based on whether or not they have that risk factor present. And then I follow them forward in time to see do they have the disease state out or the outcome I'm looking for, right? Now, these aren't always prospective. Actually, my study myself uh, that, I, that I did in, in fellowship was actually a retrospective cohort study. And basically what I ended up doing was instead of having to group these people and then follow them in forward in time, what I was actually doing was looking back in the past grouping them based on whether or not they got immediate antivenom or they held the antivenom until they were symptomatic and then follow them to see what kind of outcomes they had. So that's another study design you may find occasionally, but very frequently a cohort study is one where you're going to group people based on presence or absence of a risk factor and then follow them for the outcome. Make sense? 
Okay. So as I mentioned with the um, case control studies, you're oftentimes looking for odds ratios and things like that. Here you're going to be looking for relative risk. The reason for that is because we actually know, we set the, the groups here, we set the number of people in the group, so we know what the denominator is versus when you're doing a case control study, uh, very frequently you don't have that ability and so you're just looking at the odds. So we'll get in more detail on that a little bit later and that'll be more clear. A cross-sectional study is, is done less frequently, but it's kind of blending the two together where basically you're doing uh, a certain point in time and looking for the prevalence of disease uh, within a group. And so when I say prevalence, what does that mean? So the number of people at a single given time who have a disease day, right? So if I took all of you at this point in time and said, who has a cold? That would be the prevalence of cold in this particular sample, right? I hear a lot of sniffling, so I assume it's going to be a little higher than if I maybe did it a couple weeks ago. Could it be due to chronic stress? Yeah. Cortisol levels rising? Yeah. Probably. But, again, I have not done the study, we can say. But again, when you're doing a point prevalence or a cross-sectional thing, you're just doing a single point in time to look at the prevalence of disease based on those risk factors there. <clears throat> so again, when you're looking at a study, you want to figure out, okay, was well, it more descriptive? Is it more of an explanatory sort of effort here? You're looking at, say, like, okay, well, is the author actually doing anything? Are they actually um, causing any uh, direct interventions? Or are they just kind of observing people and just categorizing them as, as time goes on there? And again, you're going to find um, that these can be uh, controlled, they may be blinded, you can do all kinds of different things here to try to strengthen the level of evidence. And typically when you hear about a randomized controlled trial, those typically have the largest strength of evidence. Those are going to be prospective studies. And when I say randomized, what does that mean? Yeah, so the groups are completely randomized. So instead of a cohort study being where I would say group people based on the risk factor, instead what I can do is just take a, a sampling, a random sampling out of a population, and then I randomize people into different groups, and then I have an intervention for them, right? They either get drug or they get placebo, right? Or they get surgery or they don't get surgery, right? Those are kind of things I would be doing there to randomize people. And what's the point of randomizing? Yeah, you're trying to eliminate bias to make sure those groups are extremely similar to one another, right? And again, having a big sample size can kind of help out with that to eliminate a lot of those outliers. Okay, so let's do some interpretations of the data that you may actually see in the study. And this will make more sense when we talk about this in terms of the journal clubs coming up. Uh, but I will at least want to start out how we interpret uh, the, these values here. So when we say risk, what does that mean? Is it like a board game or... <laughs> So it's the chances of something happening to you, right? So again, if you get into your car and drive home, what is the risk of you having a car accident? I hope extremely low, but it could happen, right? So there's always a risk associated with everything. And so when we're doing these studies, especially these sort of prospective studies, we can look at risk, right? We can compare risk between different groups to see, well, is one group more risky of having an outcome versus another? We can find those sorts of things out here. And so again, this is where we're going to get things like absolute risk reductions. <coughs> Excuse me. We can get risk ratios, like relative risk. We're going to look at those and look at the um, confidence intervals and all that kind of good stuff. I'm losing my voice, so I may have to stop this early. Who knows? Why <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny? <laughs> Anywho. So let's say, oh, it's coming back. There you got this. Um, I'll just start typing it out. I'll just do like a live transcription and see how that goes. No. Okay, so when you're looking at risk, right, so let's say we're, we're running a study, and this is an example of one where we're looking at meningococcal disease in college students, right, so you can see during a certain time frame here. And what they were doing, they were looking at the numerator. In this case, the numerator is what? The number of people that develop meningitis, right, versus the denominator is going to be what? the total number of people that you were looking at in that group, right? So the total number of people included in that study here. So this is stuff that was reported to the CDC over one year. As I mentioned, the denominator for the risk estimates ended up coming from the Department of Education. So sometimes you'll find that these data points will come from, from different organizations, and so that's a thing to interpret when looking at this. And so when you're looking at the, the rates here, you see the number of cases, and you can see the population here. Normally this gets factored in to try to kind of even things out a little bit. So this would be the number of cases per say 1 million college students, so again 14.6 cases per 1 million, that's a rate. We'll talk more about rates a little bit later on, but that's kind of what that's referring to. But what you end up seeing here is they're looking at the rates per 100,000 with a confidence interval. Okay, So what they basically do, we're comparing all these different factors together, and so if a value, and this is your risk essentially, so if a value is greater than 1, it's a higher risk than if it's less than 1. 
100 percent yeah absolutely so <laughs> yes it is um so what you see here is values greater than ones indicate that this risk factor this particular feature of a patient is going to be either increasing or decreasing the risk of developing meningitis right so again being 18 to 23 non-students what does this do to your risk factor it appears to increase it right one would be what the baseline one is just your baseline because again this is sort of a risk ratio here you're looking at so one would be no change whatsoever um, if it was less than one what would that mean it's almost protective like people in that group actually have a less uh, lesser risk of developing meningitis in those cases here and then you notice here the 95 percent confidence interval so since we're looking at a ratio right we're looking at a relative estimate what does that mean in terms of our level for significance if it crosses what number will it make it non-significant one right if one is no difference and then if it crosses one then you know that there it is not statistically significant so in this case here what do you notice about being 18 to 23 and non-student does not cross one so you conclude this is statistically significant what would the p-value be less than, less than 0.05 you could automatically conclude that from the confidence intervals here okay very good how about here all college students they look like it was protective right it looks like they had, their risk was only 60 percent of that of those in the comparative group right so you can end up seeing here that also was a significant yes because why did not cross one right so any an example here where it maybe was uh, not statistically significant. So how about this one here being male? Because it includes one, it is not statistically significant, okay? So it includes one or crosses one in this case here. So it would appear that males had lesser incidence of meningitis, but because it is not statistically significant, we cannot say if that is really a protective feature or not, okay? How about for females? Yeah, it appears they actually have a lower risk for meningitis than those male patients did, okay? Again, you can look at all these different features here. So again, being able to interpret those risk ratios is going to be an important feature there. Being able to look to see something, is it clinically significant? It's another question, but is it statistically significant? You should be able to tell based on confidence intervals. Now, when I say clinically significant, what does that mean? You can have a one degree drop in blood pressure with a difference in medication and it'd be statistically significant, but do I care about that as a clinician? No, right? You have to make that interpretation. Is it clinically significant to you as a provider? Statistically significant, the numbers tell us that. Right? It's pretty straightforward. Here's another case where they're going to be looking at the coordinated risk and outcomes according to this quintile group for physical activity. Basically, a quintile group meaning like looking at physical activity and breaking it up into kind of 20% of the patients fall into each one of these, these quintiles here. So you notice here uh, they're looking at female patients. What do you notice about the sample size? Pretty big? Is that pretty good? Absolutely. So if you came to some conclusions here, do you think it's likely you're making a type 2 error? Less likely, right? Because it, it looks like it's a pretty highly powered study, right? Because you're looking at thousands and thousands of women. It's pretty, pretty good. So anyway, looking at this, you can see some of these uh, different percentage uh, groups here. So again, looking at their um, risk indicators. So again, kind of breaking down different components about those women to see, like, okay, what were the actual rates of um, them actually having any of these risk factors, so smoking, hypertension, etc. And then getting down here, you get to the actual analysis. So you're looking at the relative risk. So what they're using as their comparison is the people who had the least amount of physical activity and then comparing the cardiovascular risk against them, right? So why are the, the people in the first quintile one? They're basically the control group, right? So they're kind of the standard everything's being based against. If you compare their numbers to their numbers, 10 divided by 10 is is one, right? So they get one. So everyone else though is going to be compared to that. So if you end up seeing here 0 0.77, 0 0.65, 0 0.54, what do you kind of notice with these? Trends. Yeah, I started to notice a trend down. The more physical activity they had, the lesser their risk was for cardiovascular disease. Now again, there's no p-values listed here, uh, but again, you're kind of getting the idea, right? So this looks like when the value is less than one, that means it's protective. Meaning the more exercise you're getting for these women, the less likely they were to have negative cardiovascular outcome, okay? Now again, if I look at a p-value, if it included what number would that make it not significant? One, right? What if the value was zero? Well, that would mean they would have no cardiovascular risk whatsoever. Is that likely to occur? Probably not, right? Just a random chance people are going to have that. So uh, again, if it crossed one though or included one, then that would be not statistically significant. 
Uh, another case here where you're looking at uh, these, uh, the effect of women taking estrogen plus progestin, right, for like hormonal replacement therapy. Um, it's part of the Women's Health Initiative. It's kind of like a really groundbreaking study done back in the day uh, where they're looking at the effects of hormone replacement on these women and their different outcomes. But you can see here the number of subjects that had estrogen and progestin uh, versus placebo, right? So would this be a controlled trial? Mm -hmm. All right, so this would be a controlled trial. Then looking at the rates uh, or the actual incidence of coronary heart disease, stroke, et cetera. And then you can look at the risk ratio. So you'd be comparing the actual number of people in the experimental group versus the placebo group, right? This would be the denominator. This would be the numerator when you're doing that risk ratio. So what do you notice about, say, for instance, um, here is 1.29. What, what could you conclude from that, assuming it was statistically significant? Taking estrogen and progesterone puts you at greater risk for coronary heart disease, right? Or for instance, pulmonary embolism. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense? <laughs> yeah, two times the risk versus if you're taking placebo. Sounds bad, right? Yes. But again, the confidence interval has to be taken into account. It's just not uh, ending up being reported here. Um, however, what about colorectal cancer? It looks protective. Maybe being on estrogen therapy could actually be protective for that. How about hip fracture? Yeah, a lot of it makes sense, and we'll make more sense of that when we get to the ob gyn section next semester and then the effects of estrogens, but pathophysiologically, that, that does make some sense, right? Now, as I mentioned, odds ratios are going to be things that you can actually use um, frequently for like retrospective studies, like if you're looking backwards in time, say with a case control study, you end up seeing a lot of odds uh, ratios being used here. Uh, but here we're going to be looking at risk factors for meningococcal disease. So we took case patients, patients who ended up having meningitis, and then we looked at the controls. And obviously there were people who what? Who did not have meningitis. And then you look backwards in time to see what risk factors they had. And what's the point of doing that? Well, I can say, well, if they have certain risk factors, then I know they're more likely to develop meningitis, right? Or at least they're more closely associated with that. It's harder to tell cause and effect here, but uh, this may help me to produce new studies in the future where I'm doing maybe a more prospective control sort of trial there. So anyway, looking at this, we can see here the, the, the match odds ratios. Obviously, if it's, it's an odds ratio, so if there's no difference, what's the value going to be? The ratio, so 10 divided by 10 is still 1, right? So here, if the confidence interval includes 1, then it's not going to be significant. So looking here, being a freshman, what does that do to your odds of having meningitis? Increases it threefold over if you were not going to be a freshman, okay? How about, for instance, if there's anything that's protective? How about attending greater than one movie? I can do it. I guess so. Maybe you should go out and see some more movies, right? Now, again, does it always make clinical sense? No. Not always. But these are the associations that get approved here. Again, you can sometimes, even a blind squirrel finds a nut sometimes, right? So, again, you can find things just by chance alone, as it turns out. Um, being employed during school? It's close. Pretty close. But, again, because it does not include one, it is still considered to be statistically significant, right? And again, the p-value would kind of bear that out, right? Um, here, what do you think are the kind of the most uh, risky things you could be in order to increase your chances of developing meningitis? Being white race, for whatever reason, that's what they end up finding there. Again, <laughs> p-value less than, was less than 0 0.05, so you would be able to conclude that it's statistically significant. But what do you notice about the confidence interval? It's massive. Huge, right? Again, it borders on being clinically insignificant because it gets pretty close to one, does not include one, but it goes all the way to 24.2. So again, this will be hard to say, but look at the no actual numbers here. Not, not huge numbers, so maybe this is, it would be something you would look at and say, well, maybe I want to do a future research on this. Maybe I'll look to see, maybe do a case control study, or not a case, a cohort study, where I looked at patients who are white versus not, and then look, followed them for meningococcal disease, right? Again, frequently these case control studies serve for future uh, studies to be designed off of them. Now, I say relative risk. We mentioned that's going to be the risk of having the disease state versus not. The denominator is going to be your total number of observations, whereas the numerator is going to be the number of people who had the outcome. And then you can also look at what they call attributable risk. And that's basically what you're looking at is, is subtracting one value from another, right? Uh, so whether you have the outcome or not. So for instance, here, they're looking at death rate per 100,000 of the population. They're looking at it from, coronary, uh, uh, from coronary disease and lung cancer. You see here for heavy smokers versus non-smokers, if you were to do the risk ratio, for lung cancer, for smokers compared to non-smokers, what do you see? Is that pretty high? Yes. You're 32 times more likely, at least in this data set, to have lung cancer versus non-smokers. Okay, makes sense. How about from coronary disease? 
So you see some increase in risk, but maybe it's not quite as dramatic as it would be for lung cancer, right? So again, that's what we call the relative risk for something occurring here. And if you actually look at the attributable risk, this would just be one thing minus another. This is not done quite as frequently. Most of the time you're gonna be looking at relative risk here, but this would just be an example of uh, an attributable risk, right? How much of that risk is due specifically to, uh, due to that smoking, right? And here you can see that more of it is attributable to smoking for lung cancer than it is for coronary disease, okay? So let's look at some uh, interpretation of causes. So when I say confounding, what does that mean? Besides, like my tests, quite confounding. There, there are going to be outside influences that are affecting the results of a study. Things that the researcher did not take into account that could be biasing your study here. So, for instance, here's uh, a study here where they're looking at rate of cigar smoking for bald men compared with controls. So they're looking at baldness, yes or no, and they're looking at cigar smoking. And what they actually ended up finding out that the relative odds for smoking and baldness was 6.2 versus controls. So what does that mean? If you smoke cigars, you're more likely to be bald, right? Does that make any logical sense? Uh, that's I think like Kingpin or like uh, Lex Luthor or somebody. Bald and smoking. Huh? Maybe. Who could say, right? We have to do the study to find that out. However, if you notice here, they're just looking at all men. Well, who's more likely to be smoking cigars? Old men, right? Maybe some young men, but probably more like old men, right? So what if you just maybe took uh, 40 to 45 year old men, right? What if you took out the factor of young people, younger men, and the uh, older than 45, which you end up finding here is that looking at cigar smoking and baldness, you end up getting a relative odds of 0.85. So what does that mean? It would appear that cigar smoking is protective against balding? <laughs> Again, you were taking into account the, uh, the fact that age is a confounder, right? So when uh, researchers say they control for something, this is what they're talking about. They're controlling for a certain factor to make sure they're taking out the influence of that to see what the actual results are going to be when you control for that factor, okay? And again, it's not important that you do the math. You're just interpreting the final results here, okay? So looking at this, you're looking at a characteristic or factor, and you're looking at the relationship with the outcome, but the confounder is the thing you haven't taken into account, which is going to be skewing your results, and it could be affecting one or both of these cases here. Okay, so this is really important that they address confounding when you're reading a piece of literature. Um, so for instance here, if they're looking at mean daily sugar consumption um, patients with heart disease, and they had 25 control subjects. And so what they were doing is they are comparing uh, patients with heart disease versus those that were controls that did not have heart disease, and they looked at the sugar consumption. So what did you base... Or what would you say based off of this? It appears that people who had coronary heart disease probably consume more sugar. Does that make sense? Yes. Probably, yeah. Okay, so let's say we're actually going to, to look through here. and we, Let's say we control for smoking, right? So we also look at the people who had heart disease and those that did not, and we control for the factor of smoking here. And so when you actually do that, you end up finding that if you look at the mean sugar consumption and that smokers with heart disease, 152 versus 118 for smokers. So it still plays a role. Smoking has a confounding role here. However, even if you take that out and were to compare the non-smokers versus non-smokers, you still notice what? They still had a higher sugar intake, okay? So again, it's not that they can, uh, confounders only skew your results into defining nothing, but they can also have an influence here. And even if you take that out, you can still find similar results, okay? So it's really important that that relationship be kept in mind. You can control for these things that are most likely to be affecting your results. Um, so even when you held constant for smoking, the association between sugar consumption and heart disease was still there, as you'll see. So again, what, you, what would you conclude from that? So sugar intake probably has a, uh, an effect on heart disease. And what else? Smoking probably has an effect on heart disease. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah, makes pretty good sense. So again, some of the stuff you have to think through kind of logically, and it would kind of uh, make some sense there. When you're doing a multivariate analysis, that's where you actually take into account a lot of different factors here. And so again, when you're looking at here, so we mentioned um, this one before, where they're looking at exercise, the quintiles in, in women, and looking at the age-adjusted rates, and then the multivariate. When I say age-adjusted, what does that mean? They're taking the effect of age out, right? So that way you're kind of comparing apples to apples, and that way you don't have a bunch of old women who are in the, say, low exercise group and only like, you know, 18 year olds in the very high exercise group. That takes the effect of age out of it and accounts just for that one particular variable. However, when I do a multivariate controlling, I can account for other things like smoking, multivitamin use, ethanol use, and you can still see how the results change. So when I control for more of these factors, what do you notice about the analysis? 
It does change the values, but you still see a pretty similar trend, right? Trend's still there, so when you control for those factors there, because again, you may find that people who have uh, who exercise more, what do you think about their diets? Probably going to be better than people who just sit on the couch all day, right? So again, you have to take some of these um, uh, confounders out of the game, so that way you can just look at the actual uh, analysis you're looking at. Okay, what effect does exercise have on these women in terms of that? So that's where controlling for confounders comes into play. All right, uh, let's say for instance, we can look at um, the actual estrogen use. So we base estrogen use based off how much you're receiving an endometrial cancer risk, right? So looking at those that have endometrial cancer, the controls, and then you base it off of the never use estrogen, these a little bit, a medium amount, or a lot. Kind of control those, uh, taking into account all those controls. And then what do you notice here about the confidence intervals and the relative risk? So you can see that the dose of the estrogen received does have an effect on the actual rates of endometrial cancer. See, so the higher the dose you received, the higher the relative risk, right? Maybe up to a point, right? Maybe once you get to a certain point, it may uh, kind of peter out a little bit, 8.8 .8 versus 7.6. What do you notice about the confidence intervals? Pretty similar to one another, okay? So maybe there's only a certain plateau effect to how much estrogen is actually going to be influencing endometrial cancer risk, okay? Kind of make sense? So again, by taking that the factor of dose out of it, you can kind of make more um, an apples to apples sort of comparison. Okay. So some other things to consider, you know, have authors addressed uh, the possibility that bias may be here? They absolutely should, and if not, uh, if they say, nope, there's no bias here, no confounders, they, they're lying to you, right? They're trying to sell you something most likely. Um, and try to make sure that they are listing the most likely confounders, you know, is the list reasonable? You have to make that interpretation. Uh, are there known risks that you know about that maybe they didn't take into account? Um, and so if there are, then you just have to take it kind of with a grain of salt, right? And so have they tried to control for the confounding? If not, then you may not be able to take a whole lot away from their statistical analysis, but they have, and you still find a you know statistically significant result, that's still important there, right? So that's one thing you want to uh, certainly consider. So, finish right on time. If you have any questions on that section? This is the end of the testable material for this test. Let's see if there's any questions here on the board. <laughs> Nothing at all, so I'm sure you all have very good high functioning understanding of this. For um, next week, we're going to do half is going to be a journal club. I'm going to have, we're all going to do it together as a group. I will post up the article this weekend for you to review. Please review it beforehand. Um, and then we will do the review on the second half of class. Okay? Any questions? No, I'll see you next time.